Okay, so welcome everyone to today's Sunday Zoom meeting on A Course in Miracles. And um, today we'll, we'll continue with reading from what it says. And I know we've been taking that quite slowly, but it's, it's a beautiful piece. And it really, it's worth taking it slowly because it contains the entire thought system of A Course in Miracles. So it's, it's a brilliant introduction to the, um, to the metaphysics. Um, we have sort of um, exhausted the idea of knowledge. I'm blue in the face talking about knowledge and heaven and oneness. Um, needless to say, that's made me popular and unpopular. Everyone wants there to be consciousness in heaven, and there's not. There's just God. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to sort of rehash um, the beginning uh, where we talked about knowledge. So in what it says, we're going to begin, I, I will go back just slightly um, to where it says the world of perception, uh, on the other hand, is the world of time, of change, of beginnings and endings. So we've talked about knowledge and we've said that there is uh, no knower and that which is known. There is just knowing, which is what God is. And there's no separateness in heaven. There's just oneness. Um, there is God and he is extending God and the extensions of God are called Christ and those extensions of God extend God. So it's just God. Um, and that's what it's like in heaven. Now, OK, so egos hate this because the ego wants there to be me. Um, but, but I think the really, really important thing to take from this is that all of our what we were created for and all of our happiness and all of our joy is to be like this vessel into which God pours and it fills us up and it overflows into other vessels. And so all of the love and joy and peace and happiness that we've ever craved is in having God in, in, in our mind and nothing else. All of the misery, the guilt, the unhappiness, the judgment, the inadequacy, fear, um, the, 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 the horror, the, all of this is because um, we wanted to have our own voice. <laughs> we were like, no, um, I don't want part of God's oneness anymore. I want to be a me. And, and it sucks. Um, and, so, and, and so really, I think the advantage in terms of understanding God's oneness and, and knowledge is that we understand that our salvation, our happiness is in being that vessel into which God pours um, and that ecstatic happiness just pours out from us into, into other vessels. So I hope that makes sense as an analogy. It's not a perfect analogy. There's no separate vessels in heaven, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but all the joy comes from shutting the voice in our head up. Jesus says, um, you know, salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts. So once we just shut all the concepts down, or at least just even, you know, we don't have to shut them all down. We just need to withdraw our allegiance to the concepts in our own mind. And what's, what's there in us then, um, you know, in the real world, or, or even now in the holy instant, is the thoughts that we think with God you know, um, causeless joy, um, you know, non-specific abstract love itself. Um, and, and so this is, this is really what the course is all about. It's, you know, it's saying you have a crazy voice in your head, that's going to speak first. It's wrong about everything. Um, and what you do is you withdraw your allegiance to it and you open yourself up to something else that will replace it. So you let go of concepts. So what replaces it is the part of your mind with no concepts. And that's where all the peace and the joy and the love is. And so, um, you know, ultimately in heaven, that state of knowledge is that state where there is no concept except God. As he's going to tell us, you know, here in the what it says, um, th there is no thought but God. <laughs> and that is what heaven is. Um, yeah, all the noise was the problem. You know, everything was perfect and we messed it up by wanting our own voice uh, instead of just having God's. So that's kind of what we've covered in a lot of detail um, in previous videos. Uh, so we're, we're not going to talk any more about knowledge. Uh, we're going to move on to perception. Um, 
And so perception, right. The world of perception, on the other hand, is the world of time, of change, of beginnings and endings. In heaven, um, there is no change. What God creates is eternal, unchanging, absolute and unassailable. Um, there is uh, no time. Time is um, sin, guilt and fear about the illusory separation projected out. And that becomes past, present and future. Past is sin, present is guilt, future is fear. Um, so there is no time in heaven. Heaven is timeless. Uh, it doesn't mean there's eternal time in heaven. It means there is the absence of time in heaven. Um, and in heaven, there is no beginnings and endings. Again, in heaven, if there was a beginning, that would mean that there was a past where something wasn't, and then there was a present where something magically appears. So now, again, we can't understand that because there was a, there's a process of creation going on in heaven. But again, we can't understand that within the concepts of time and space. Um, so in heaven, there's no beginnings and there's no endings. What God creates does not end. It is eternal, unchanging, absolute and unassailable. It is always true. OK. Um, Keith, I just want to say that yeah. the sound quality is not as good as usual. I don't know if other people are finding that. It's not as clear as usual. OK. I it may it, it may be my my uh, internet then if, Freddie, if it sounds online. fine to me yeah okay. it's fine to me too okay uh -huh. thank you thank you yeah have a fiddle with your stuff there Freddie. see if you can get it get it any better okay. <laughs> um you. okay so um what we're saying here then is that this is the world of duality in contrast to heaven's perfect non-duality um, only God's oneness is real, so everything we're perceiving is an illusion. So, um, so once we talk about perception, well, once we've left heaven, once we've left knowledge, everything's an illusion. Nothing is true. And all we have available to us is the memory of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, the memory of God's oneness. That's all that's available to us. Once we've left knowledge, once no, we've never left heaven, but we think we have. And so everything is wrong because we haven't left heaven. So, um, so perception is to do with lies <laughs> uh, straight away. And, but that's what we're stuck with. And the Holy Spirit is going to help us to undo. Okay. Um, Yeah, so just, just down here, all, all illusions, because everything is an illusion, they would, have, they would all have an apparent beginning and an apparent end, which again means they have nothing to do with God, because what he is, creates is eternal, unchanging, absolute, and unassailable. Okay, so moving on. It is based on interpretation, not facts. So perception is based on interpretation, not facts. Now, Jesus tells us in the course that the only fact is God and all other facts are illusory. Um, there are no facts in consciousness because consciousness itself is an illusion. So what we are, we are one with God in heaven. Um, there is the, 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 the crazy mad idea, the tiny mad idea that we can perceive ourselves separate from God. Um, that we can be one of those pots with an idea in its mind apart from God. Um, but, but, but even that is an illusion because heaven is oneness and oneness cannot be destroyed. So this idea that there's a me um, that can perceive itself and separate from God and to be unhappy with the status quo in heaven and launch a rebellion and walk out. Um, so again, this is a dream. This, this isn't actually true. Okay. Um, so with all, everything being an illusion right now, there are two ways of perceiving illusions. And the Course calls this the ego and the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of where Jesus is starting here, uh, which it is based on interpretation, not facts. And the ego's interpretation of illusions will lock us further into illusions 
it will confirm that the separation from God is real, that my guilt is real, and that my fear of God's retribution is justified. Now, all that, 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 that same guilt and fear precedes the projection of the world. Um, uh, it was the originally, it was this terror of God's retribution. And then we, we denied that and we split it off and we projected it out into an actual world that we could see outside of ourselves. And now rather than having God being the one that's after us, we see everyone else in the world being after us and trying to attack us and poised to attack us. Um, so the ego's interpretation of everything that has been projected out will, um, will confirm to us that the separation is real, that I'm a personal self, um, that I've succeeded in rebelling against God and that everything is out to get me. Now, I guess it's important to say that we're not asked in the world of illusions um, to deny our experience of the world. That's, yes, that's what's in our mind. It is the thought of separateness and guilt and fear projected out into the world. And, um, but, but our job within this dream of a world is not to go, well, there's no world because we do believe there's a world. Um, our job is not to deny the world, it is to deny the ego's interpretation of the world. So that's our job. The ego will give us the interpretation that the world is a bad place, that evil is out there, that I need to be in a constant state of defense because attack is coming any minute, which is because I attack God. Um, that's what the ego is going to tell me constantly. Um, and so my job is not to deny the world that's out there, it is to deny my ego's internal dialogue connected with what it needs. And, and really all we do is we withdraw our allegiance from the voice in our head. We understand that the voice in our head is the ego. And we say, I don't know what anything is for. You know, give me a different way of looking at things. And all we've done is we've dropped all the concepts and that connects us to our Holy Spirit mind where there's no concepts and where there's peace, you know? And as we work with that, we realize that that right mind is never actually upset about anything. It's actually perfectly at peace all the time. So our forgiveness process, and okay, this is gonna take a while to, 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 to settle in, but ultimately our, our forgiveness process is, you know, the world does what the world does, our ego is like, you know, hurt and horrified and angry and, you know, defensive and poised to attack. And, and it's for us to shut all that down for a minute and go, I don't know what anything is for and connect with our Holy Spirit mind. And in that connection, realize, you know, something, this has nothing to do with me. <laughs> um, what does it have to do with this piece in my right mind? And the answer is nothing. So I just want to make that point that we're not asked to deny the world because we do believe in it. There's no point in fooling ourselves that we don't. But what we want to do is we want to deny that it has any effect on the piece in my right mind. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. So it is the world of birth and death founded on the belief in scarcity. So this is the world of perception. Um, so birth, death, and scarcity refer, of course, to the illusory world and the illusory body. Uh, the world is in a constant state of lack. Problems are never solved. The world is always on fire. You know, no sooner does one problem get started than a new problem starts up. No sooner do we think we've solved a problem than it comes back around in a different form. So the, the, the world is always going to be on fire. It was created to always be on fire so that we would keep looking out in the world and trying to fix what's happening instead of being in our mind where we could connect with the Holy Spirit and then do the whole thing. So it's meant to be on fire. You're meant to be like, you know, 
<laughs> out, out there making the world real and trying to fix the world and trying to save the world and, you know, trying to make everything better. Um, and none of it will work, but it will keep you out of your mind where the Holy Spirit is. So that's the ego strategy. So in terms of, um, let's see, um, birth and death founded on the belief in scarcity. I mean, the, the body is programmed to die uh, by the ego. Um, and, and it's programmed that way because um, yeah, the ego was apparently birthed um, in God's death. We, we murdered oneness. We, we, we think we tore cause and effect apart, destroying oneness in heaven. Uh, knowledge was undone. Now it's all perception. So we think we've destroyed it. And when I say we, I mean that, that one split mind that's dreaming all of us. I don't mean we as individuals think we've done that because that's denied. Um, Okay, so, so the body is programmed to die because uh, the ego was birthed in death and because the ego is constantly anticipating uh, its death when God catches up with it and restores oneness by destroying separateness. Now again, none of this is true, um, <laughs> but this is what's going on in, in the split mind. So it's what's going on in a part of our mind that we don't have access to right now. So, so the body was, um, you know, designed to be in a constant state of lack. Um, ultimately, no amount of food, air, water, stimulation, shelter, or love is ever enough for the body. It needs more, 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 more. It's in a constant state of lack. Um, because the ego thinks it's, one, it's independence from God's oneness. And the terrible price of that um, is, is the horrific lack, um, because, because nothing, nothing will ever fill that God's love and peace and oneness. No, nothing will ever take the place of that. Um, and, so, and so the world projected by that mind is, is reflecting that lack that's in the mind, the acknowledgement of that lack that's in the mind. And that's why the body shows up that way, constantly trying to fill itself up and nothing ever filling it. It's like a black hole. Um, so it, which will be the world of perception, is learned rather than given and selective in its perceptual emphases. So again, with knowledge or heaven or God's oneness, there is just the perception of oneness. There's no differences. Everything is one. Uh, but with perception, perception obviously is the opposite of heaven. Um, and now um, there's, there's none of that perception of sameness. There's none of that perception of oneness. Now it's all the perception of differences. And so, so just to kind of preempt slightly the whole introduction to special relationships. Um, our special relationships are totally, um, you know, founded on this uh, selectivity in perceptual emphasis in the sense that, you know, I love the person I'm in love with and I love them in a special way. And in order for me to love that person, I have to not love everyone else in the same way. So this is what Jesus means by perceptual emphasis. Um, you know, I love you more than I love everyone else. You know, you're more deserving of love than everyone else. And in order to love you, I, I will not love everyone else in the same way. So that's like an example of what Jesus is talking about with perceptual emphasis. And, and so really, we're, you know, we either want to, because of this lack Jesus is talking about that's inside of us, how do you put it back up there? Um, yeah, founded on the belief in scarcity. So we believe that we're lacking and miserable. Uh, and what, we've got, what, what, what we're lacking is love. And so our special relationships are this, this desire to go out there and get love, you know? Um, and so, you know, we, we see someone else and we believe, well, you know, they have the love that I want. 
want. And so what I've got to do is I've got to manipulate them. I've got to make them think I'm useful to them. I've got to make them think I'm attracted to them. I need to somehow like hoodwink them into like associating with me and giving me this love that I need. Um, and, and it's really like a cannibalism. And, 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 you know, it's not just in romantic relationships. It's, it's, you know, if we're doing a course and we want the teacher to like us or to value us, our contributions or anything like that, that, that this is us, you know, craving this validation of ourselves, this, the, the, you know, this love, this, this, this um, appreciation from someone that like will fill me up in some way. Or, you know, we talked in one of the other videos about how, you know, with pop stars and movie stars, we see them and, you know, immediately we want an autograph. We want a photograph with them. I want what they have to rub off on me in some way. So I, I can give myself this value that I'm sorely missing and that I, I can somehow fill myself up on what they have. You know, and within the ego thought system, if somebody else has something, then I don't, you know. So, you know, um, I've, I've got to steal it from them. I've, I've got to cannibalize them. And again, you know, the entire advertising industry is based on this. You know, if we can get like some, you know, sexy actor or actress to promote a product, um, it works. It actually works because we will associate, you know, the qualities we, we attribute to that actor or actress then with the product. And if I drink the product somehow magically, I will like imbibe, you know, cannibalize their worth into me. And this might be like a, you know, something that will fill up the, the gap that's left with God's absence. Um, and then the opposite of that, of course, of cannibalism is kill, you know, so I've got to be without my guilt. So I need other guilty people in the world, other evil people in the world, so they can be the guilty ones. So I can point at them and go, you know, you're what's wrong with the world. You know, you're the one that killed God. It wasn't me <laughs> at an unconscious level. <laughs> Um, so we need people, we, we need to feel innocent. And for that, we need other people to be guilty. Okay. So that's what Jesus is saying here. So, the, so this whole, um, you know, the, this whole thought system of like lack wasn't, it's got nothing to do with how we were created by God. This is what we taught ourselves. And then. And then there's no more of that seeing everything as one, seeing everything as joined, seeing everything as the same. That, you know, that's, now that's gone and everything is like a, a perceptual emphasis. Everything is different. You know, my attention will go on to you because you're a worse person than anyone else. My attention will go on you because you, you have something I want. You have like maybe love that, that I can cannibalize from you by associating with you. Um, so this is what's going on with like um, perceptual emphasis. Like in the course, Jesus says, you know, make this year different by making everything the same. Um, because the problem is the ego makes everything different. So that's what he's sort of saying here with perceptual emphases. Okay, so this world of perception then, it is unstable in its functioning and inaccurate in its interpretations. Well, it's unstable because it was born out of the attack on God. And there's this constant expectation of attack and return. Now, again, that's, that's denied about God and split off and projected out onto a world. And now that attack from the world is what I'm constantly anticipating. So, of course, that's unstable. There's this constant expectation of attack of someone trying to cannibalize me of someone trying to kill me. How do I know they're doing that? Because I'm trying to do the same thing to everyone else. So of course it's unstable. Now, um, Jesus isn't saying to us that, you know, you want to watch this in yourself the way you try to cannibalize famous people and, you know, teachers and lovers and, you know, um, you know, course teachers that declare themselves enlightened and suddenly it's like, oh, that's the teacher I have to have. That's the one that'll, you know, I can cannibalize and I can like, and again, Jesus isn't saying, you know, you know, shame on you. What he wants us to do is look at this without feeling guilty. That's all he's asking us to do, to notice this rather than think it's what you are. So there's a massive emphasis in the course where Jesus is going, look at how the ego works. Look how insane it is. 
Um, so his course is not all about like love and light and everything's fabulous. He's going, yeah, here's how it's love and light and fabulousness, but you have to look at the darkness. You have to look at this thought system in your mind. And, and once you're able to look at it, then the part of you that's looking at it isn't the thought system. And that will undo it. So, you know, we have to cannibalize oxygen. We have to cannibalize food. You know, we have to like eat other living beings, um, whether it's plant or animal. We, we, we have to like, you know, kill and eat and cannibalize and try to fill ourselves up because there's this terrible emptiness because we're no longer with God. Um, uh, and so, you know, there's no point in feeling guilty about cannibalizing oxygen and there's no point in feeling guilty about, you know, cannibalizing food. Um, and there's no point in feeling guilty about noticing yourself cannibalizing other people, wanting to associate with the right people, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, um, having the good opinion of others. Um, it's to notice this in yourself, to begin noticing it. Um, so that's important where, you know, Jesus does not want us to feel guilty. He wants us to look at this crap show and not feel guilty about it. <laughs> You know, so just watch how you want to make other people the bad person, how you want to be unfairly treated, how you want to cling to your victimhood and your suffering, and how you, you want to cling to the right people that can get you in the right circles and you'll be thinking well of and, you know, that will love you and, you know, um, which brings in the special relationship bargain, which is like, you know, I will do this in the relationship and you will do this in return and then there will be love. And the minute you do not do it, it's no longer a special love relationship. Now it's a special hate relationship. And I despise you. And, you know, you are the worst sinner that ever walked the earth. And how could you do this to me? Um, so, you know, special, special love is just, um, you know, um, it, it's just hate, um, a veil drawn over hatred. Um, and, and, and as soon as the special relationship bargain is broken, then all that hate comes out that was there all the time. So again, you know, once a love is special, um, once it excludes anyone, uh, it's not love. It's a veil drawn over hatred. So real love um, excludes nobody. It excludes one person. It's not real love. So we have to look at, you know, again, we've got to look at the areas in our life where we want to exclude everyone. You know, Jesus isn't, isn't even saying go out there and include everyone. He's going, will you look at the fact that you don't want to include everyone? Will you look at the fact that you don't want everyone going back to heaven with you? <laughs> you know, you'd much rather that several, if not more people, you know, we're, we're damned to eternity. Um, and, and, and just look at the fact that that's got nothing to do with God's love. That's, that's, that's your special love. That's, that's your nonsense. So again, all we're asked to do is look at this, not to feel guilty about it. Again, if, if your forgiveness process makes you feel guilty, you're not doing forgiveness. What you're meant to do is look at this crap show without guilt. So we've got to escape from these insane concepts of our ego. Um, and we do that by withdrawing our allegiance to them asking to see it differently, admitting I don't know what anything's for, and that part of our mind where there is no concepts, the Holy Spirit arises, and this is a pure awareness. That's what it is. Awareness doesn't judge. You know, um, what, you know we say our forgiveness um, merely looks and waits and judges not. It doesn't do anything. It looks and waits and judges not. It is simply awareness. That's the magic, and that's all that's being asked of us. So Jesus is going to go into a lot of detail here about, you know, what a crap show the ego is. He's not saying feel guilty about it. He's saying when you look at it, not feel guilty about it. But just realize it doesn't work. Um, okay, so unstable and it's functioning and inaccurate in its interpretations. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I guess it's, well, no, let's tackle that as we go further, right? 
So Jesus says, from knowledge and perception, respectively, two distinct thought systems arise, which are opposite in every respect. Opposite in every respect. Everything the ego made is the opposite of heaven. Um, okay, so Jesus is talking here about the thought system of God and God's reality and the ego. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit and the ego just yet. Um, because knowledge is heaven. Okay. So he makes the point that in the realm of knowledge, no thoughts exist apart from God. There's no like, you know, God's son going, la, 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 my own thoughts, my own thoughts. Oh, let's tune into God's. Or, you know, there's none of that. Just, you know, again, bear in mind, salvation is oneness with God, but there's nothing else but God. So I think that's important in the realm of knowledge. No thoughts exist apart from God. There is no thought of me. Because God and his creation share one will. One will. God's will. The world of perception, however, is made by the belief in opposites and separate wills in perpetual conflict with each other and with God. So the minute we believe that we're separate from oneness, well, we believe that we've attacked oneness and can expect attack in return. So straight away, there's the belief in opposites. You know, oneness is oneness. If I don't want it, that's an opposing will. It's a separate will. And now I'm in conflict with God because God is just oneness. So now I'm at war with God so I can get the hell away from this oneness and be this like separate thing. Um, and we're in perpetual conflict with God. That's really all that's going on is the ego's mm -hmm. conflict with God. And um, that's just getting denied and, you know, projected out into a world which is just this symbol the symbolism of that war with God. So again, you know, uh, my war with God and my expectation of God's vengeance, that's, that's simply getting projected out onto all the people in the world. Okay. What perception sees and hears appears to be real because it permits into awareness only what conforms to the wishes of the perceiver. Okay, so, so again, there, you know, Jesus says, you know, there is no world. It's the central teaching of the course. Um, but we have the experience of a world. And so, you know, Jesus plays what is in the course and he goes like, you know, you, you know, you see with eyes that don't see. You, you think you hear with ears that don't hear. You know, you think with a brain that doesn't actually think. He's saying this is all illusion. You know, you're not a body. Um, and so and so really, you know. What's going on is like we're we're we're, we're like strapped up to a virtual reality machine. And we're being shown images. And we're being shown, uh, we're being given sounds, and you know that there are sensors attached, you know, and and it makes us think that we're touching things that aren't there. And so none of this is real, none of this is actually happening. You know, it's like being on the holodeck of the USS Enterprise. None of it's actually real. Um, and, and and so the, the crucial point Jesus is making here is that the ego put all of this here so you would interpret it to mean that the separation from God is real, that you're separate from everyone else, and that sin and evil is true, and that um, guilt is real, and that fear is justified, and attack is justified. So, so the ego projected this illusion of a world, and we're in the holodeck, having this virtual reality simulation and all of it is there. So I will perceive it as meaning I am separate from God. I am separate from everyone else. Evil is real. Um, guilt is real. Um, I can anticipate, you know, that fear is real. I can anticipate bad things coming and that I need to be in a constant state of defense 
um, and that, you know, I need to attack in order to, you know, protect myself. So it's all put there. So we will make those interpretations. And the ego supplies that liberally <laughs> in every single instance. Okay, so this leads to a world of illusions, a world that needs constant defense precisely because it is not real. So this is a really kind of um, crucial um, idea in the course. Um, Jesus says things like, you know, um, it's in my defenselessness that my safety lies. So, so he's, he's talking about the same thing here. A world that needs constant defense precisely because it is not real. Uh, we only defend illusions. Only defend illusions. Love and truth are never in danger and need no defense. So whenever I defend anything, it is the defense of an illusion. Now, again, my personal mind will argue vehemently with that. I need to defend my reputation. I need to defend my money. I need to defend my family. You know, I need to, um, whatever the case may be, I mean, the personal mind's gonna go, hang on a minute, yeah. But the point is the personal mind's an illusion. If I'm in the Holy Spirit mind, you know, if I've said, I don't know what anything's for, I've withdrawn my allegiance to, to concepts, and thoughts, you know, I've asked for something else to replace it, you know, that, that place of peace and stillness uh, where the, the, the memory of the thoughts I think with God, love and peace, oneness um, and joy, um, then that place needs no defense. So straight away, if I'm thinking something needs defense, all it means is I'm in the personal mind. I'm not in the Holy Spirit mind. Okay, when you have been caught in the world of perception, you are caught in a dream. Again, this is virtual reality. This is a dream. It is not true. But crucially, we're not asked to go around going, you're a dream and you're a dream and this is a dream and that's a dream. But the fact is, you know, okay, it's a dream. Um, but that would be an unworthy form of denial to pretend we don't believe in something that we do. The, the way, you know, the Holy Spirit helps us out of the dream is we slip back into that Holy Spirit mind. And then we know that the world hasn't taken my peace from me. Okay, my personal mind thinks it has, but my personal mind doesn't exist. What I am is what I am when I join with the Holy Spirit. And so no matter what happens in the dream, I can slip back into that space where, where there's no concepts. Um, and it's always peaceful. You know, the thoughts I think with God are always there. Um, and nothing in the dream. So that, that, that's how we undo our belief in the dream, ultimately. It's not by pretending, we, you know, we don't believe it's all a dream. <laughs> um, it's, it's by one situation at a time, hearing our personal mind go, this has taken my peace from me, and then slipping back into our Holy Spirit mind and going, no, it hasn't. I was just in my wrong mind. So whenever we're caught in the world of perception, which is what we can see and hear and feel and touch, um, that's one aspect of perception. And then the other aspect of perception is how I am interpreting it. If I'm in my wrong mind, it has everything to do with me. If I'm in my Holy Spirit mind, it has nothing to do with me. And then Jesus says, you cannot escape without help. How the hell could we escape from that? Everything is set up to prove to us that we are separate, to confirm all the lies. We're separate. There's no God here. We're separate from everyone else. Sin is real. Evil is real. Guilt is real. Fear is real. Everything is set up to convince us of that. 
and we have this insane voice in our head just interpreting everything exactly the way it's supposed to, the way it's scripted. Everything was scripted so this insane voice in my mind would come to these conclusions um, and, and it's, it's confirmed. So there's, there's, there's no way out of that. Um, so we, we need help from outside of the personal mind, outside of Keith. And, and this is where Jesus is introducing the Holy Spirit. And, you know, and, and, and we have, you know, Jesus as a symbol of this right mind that's still inside of us. So if you like, Jesus is a symbol of our own healed mind. Because, you know, he realized he wasn't the ego. And I mean, God didn't create, you know, billions and billions and billions and trillions and trillions of life forms. Um, there's one son dreaming himself to be all of these life forms. So these life forms are all the figures in the dream. You know, Keith is a figure in the dream. Helen was a figure in the dream. Jesus is a figure in the dream. Everyone on this call is a figure in the dream. So we are just an image that that one split mind has of itself. But in the same way that with a hologram, you can cut it up into pieces, each tiny piece still reflects the entire hologram. Okay. So um, again, the insane voice in my head is the dream figure. Um, and so, you know, G Jesus is a representation for us of unconditional love and to triumph over the world and enlightenment. Um, and, so, and so this is a wonderful symbol for our own right mind, Jesus. I mean, the same mind that dreamt Jesus is dream, dreaming you. So Jesus is as real as you are, <laughs> which isn't real. <laughs> but the mind that's dreaming us is, right? Um, that's the dreamer of the dream. So Jesus is a wonderful symbol for the healed mind. The Holy Spirit is the symbol for the mind that's never bought the bullshit, that's never come into the dream. You know, that from the start went, this is nonsense. And this has no effect on anything. Don't pay any attention to that. It's not true. So that's the part of our mind. The Holy Spirit is, you know, the symbolic, you know, um, where the course addresses that. And then, and then Jesus is, you know, sim symbolizing the part of us that came into the dream and got the hell out. But ultimately, it's all the same thing. So it feels like I've been talking for a while there. I think I should throw it open to some questions if anyone has them. So if you have a question, put your hand up. Eli, you seen any hands up? I don't think I am. George has his hand Sorry, up. George has his hand up. Perfect. George, you go for us. Keith, I just wanted to say that was a really, really good overview of all of it. And um, I loved that. And I took notes and I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank so you much. very I'm much. I it was helpful. I'm glad it was helpful. It was. Thank you. Anyone else have some questions they want to shout or clarify or argue with me about or <laughs> anything in the chat, Eli? No, um, no, uh, people, I we're asking about what page you were reading from, but we've got a few more hands up now. So Julia okay. is there. Cool. Go ahead, Julia. Uh, yeah, I basically wanted to to say thank you because I I love um, that you're taking your time with almost every word because it it makes me sink in and. 
<sighs> wow. I <laughs> love this stuff and the way that you you extend and you make links and oh my god my mind yeah i'm celebrating you <laughs> right oh now. that's it's, wonderful it's Thanks. amazing yeah i can listen to you for hours by the way <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you um who have we next anyone else see that sally you can go ahead okay hello everybody i hope everybody's having a great day um, I, I, I've really been working at sitting with the Holy Spirit in non-judgment and, uh, and it's really wonderful. I, when you talk about when you have um, a, something, a grievance, and you hand it over to the Holy Spirit and, and you sit with the Holy Spirit until you're okay with it. I, 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 I was wondering if you could describe, like, is that like... Um, like how you physically would do that? Is that like a, a meditation or do you keep it in your mind as you go through your day doing things? Uh, keep in mind that you're holding the Holy Spirit's hand and thinking about this and trying to uh, have him heal it. I, if you could clarify that for me, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, Jesus goes into this in a little bit of detail, so we'll, we'll get his take on it in a moment, but that's just preempt that. Um, because I think it's such an important question. I think we can't talk about anything more important than the forgiveness process and trying to lock it in our mind. Um, so the key thing to understand is if I am, because look, I mean, the goal is let's be, let's not be separate. Let's not be an ego. Let's be joined with the Holy Spirit in my mind. Let, let's have this non-judgmental awareness in my mind all the time, even for the crazy voice in my head. Like the crazy voice in my head is still going to be there, but let's have this awareness of it. Um, and so, and, and if I am joined with the Holy Spirit, then I am incapable of being rattled by anything in the world. So that's a really key, crucial point. If I'm joined with the Holy Spirit, I'm invulnerable. What does it have to do with me? What does it have to do with this peace in my mind? See, at the end of the day, we're not an insane voice in our head and we're not a body. What we are is a mind, and a mind means non-judgmental awareness. So basically, trying, and and I know that I'm. I, that's my goal anyway. Our goal anyway is to be in the Holy Spirit mind. So we're putting ourselves in that um, state, uh, psychologically now, but in time, it will be. Yeah, for, for now, I don't know if you cut out there. I'm going to talk anyway. Um, for now, what we're going to do... And what does this have to do with the, with the me that's with the Holy Spirit, holding the Holy Spirit's hand in peace and love? Yes. Okay. Right? So you, is is I, that it? So, so we're, just like, we're just like trying to fly. You know, we're, 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 we're just trying to imagine it and trying to, to get to that point where it is a part of our thinking. Am I, is that, do I have it right? Well that we would have this non-judgmental awareness in our mind at all times. And, and when we do, we're going to be invulnerable. But here's the thing, we have this thing called unconscious guilt, which means we're not going to stay joined with the Holy Spirit in our mind. We are going to let that drop and we're gonna go back into being this insane voice in my head, which thinks that I've had to create my happiness and I have to cannibalize people and I have to like attack people in order to like get rid of my guilt and to try and find this love replacement for God. So, you know, so, the, so the, our ideal, you know, what we're, what we're striving towards is this non-judgmental awareness in our mind all the time, this constant joining with the Holy Spirit. That's what we're striving for. That is not going to happen. We are far too terrified <laughs> of letting go of this um, illusory self, but that we think we are. We're far too terrified of letting that go completely. And so we're going to slip back into the personal mind. And as soon as we do, all that unconscious guilt is bubbling there. So guilt okay. means I'm not going to stay joined with the light. And guilt means that, you know, I'm going to go back as a personal mind and all that guilt is inside of me. And now the hungry dogs of fear have been sent out into the world. And I'm just unconsciously waiting for someone to step out of line. I'm just waiting to see a scrap of guilt anywhere. Just show me a news program 
with an evil person, you know, just let someone cut me off on the motorway. We're just waiting, waiting, waiting. And then like, you know, we'll let them have it because all that guilt that's inside me, all that self-hatred, I can project that out onto them so I don't have to look at it in myself. So that's what's going to happen. Now, there's no point in pretending that that's not going to happen because that's going to happen. Um, and so, but this is brilliant. This is, this is excellent. This is the unconscious guilt. And the whole course is about undoing our unconscious guilt. So, so now what we want to do is we want to look at the person we want to murder, that we want to kill, um, you know, if not physically, then in our mind. Um, and we want to understand that that is our own self-hatred, our guilt, and um, from what we did to God, that we destroyed knowledge, that we, we, we destroyed oneness in order that I could be this personal self. Um, and now there's just this desire not to look at that in myself and to project it out onto someone else. Uh, so I don't have to look at it on myself and to attack them for what is my guilt. So that's just what the insane person in mind does. Um, and so we're going to catch ourselves with all this, you know, hatred and bile inside of ourselves. So, what, you know, so what we want to do is we have to, first of all, step one is we have to, you know, um, unwind projection so all we're asked to do is to actually stop thinking everything i'm feeling is because this is what you did to me you know and, and to actually take it back and look at it in myself and go this was already inside of me waiting for someone to step out of line and to do something you know bad on my illusory personal self um so so you know what someone did did not cause this uh, this was inside of me waiting for someone to do something. So well, the first thing we do is we go, if I was joined with the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't feel this. So why am I feeling this? Because I wasn't joined with the Holy Spirit. I was off, you know, looking for a bit of the ego's action. I was being a personal self. So that's why it happened. That's why all this like horrific, ugly stuff is coming up inside of me and my peace is gone. My peace is gone because I left peace in my mind. I went into the place where there's no peace. I just wanted someone to blame. Um, so that's what happened. So, so what we want to do is, in the situation, we want to take that guilt off our scapegoat. And we want to look at that in ourselves. What I've just seen in you, what I've just hated in you, that's what I didn't want to look at in myself. Now, so again, we're back to this idea, you know, of we're letting go of concepts. So, we, you know, we, we, we can't go back to the Holy Spirit until we drop all our concepts. Because, um, you know, the concepts are, no, but what you did was real. I'm not making it up. You know, you really did punch me. Um, I have every right to feel upset about that. You know, here I was, I was a perfectly happy ego. Um, even though I threw God's love and happiness in his face and you punched me and now everything is wrong and bad and you've ruined everything and I could have been happier as an ego if it wasn't for you. So these are the concepts, you know. So someone gave you a thumb, right? Well, that's a fact. But as Jesus says, we're, we're, we're never upset with a fact. We're, we're upset with an interpretation of the fact. And the interpretation of the fact is you did it to me. Um. But, but, but who's the me? If I was joined with the Holy Spirit, I'm not this personal self or body. Um, so again, we're back to this idea that I'm defending an illusion. So, so we've, we've taken it off, the, this projection away from the illusory world and illusory bodies. And we're now looking at it inside our own mind. Um, and so that's, that's step one. I take responsibility for the fact that I am feeling this because I'm not, I wasn't in my right mind. I was in my wrong mind. I needed someone to blame for all the unconscious guilt there. I'm here, it's happening. But isn't this fabulous? Now I can undo my guilt. So that's step one. Um, and then, you know, what we want to do is we, we want to then look at it. But, but, you know, we don't want to look at it as I need to get rid of this. This is bad. This means I'm a bad course student. Uh, I'm failing Jesus's course. 
I don't want to go anywhere near him. I'm too embarrassed because look, I've made a mess of it. Uh, I shouldn't be feeling this way. I should be loving light. Um, so, so this is where we do forgiveness wrong. The first thing you want to do is go, this is my unconscious guilt. Okay, so it's not right or wrong or good or bad. It doesn't exist. That's the whole forgiveness process. But what I want to do is I want to let it be there. I want to be the allowing of it. I want to be, remember, you must be the non-judgmental awareness. If you're not a non-judgmental awareness, you're caught in concepts. That's the ego's world. You're not in your Holy Spirit minds. Now, that suffering is going to be there. I'm going to have that adrenaline rush, that racing heartbeat. Um, I'm, I'm going to have that flush feeling or, you know, sweating or, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to have those unpleasant things happening. All right. That's just what is. So this is just your unconscious guilt. What you want to do is remove the psychological suffering. Because the psychological suffering is just all the concepts, but you did it to me. So, so we want to allow the feelings to be there, but what we want, what we need to do now. So, so to hell with the concepts, they're all wrong. Okay, that's that's all from a mind that doesn't exist, Keith. So we, we want to drop the concepts. That's why we say, I don't know what anything's for. Give me a different way of looking at it. All the concepts are wrong because there is no me and there is no you, and there was no thump. Um, you know. What we want to do is we want to look at the guilt because, you know, this is what's projecting everything that happens in the world. This is responsible for it. This is what keeps me from just waking in God. Um, so what we want to do is we just want to sit with, you know, the feelings that are coming up with, without the concepts. So that's why we say it's a non-judgmental looking with Jesus or the Holy Spirit. That's the magic. So we bring this to that place. And then what you'll be aware of is this peaceful space of your right mind as the guilt is there. So all you're asked to do is not just have all those awful emotions happening and you be identified with them going, you know, this is terrible. I'm the victim of the world. Can't believe it. You know, happened to me again. Um, all we're asked to do is to allow whatever, you know, feelings are there to be there, get away from the concepts about it and just call it our unconscious guilt. And then, and then, but, but this awareness is co-present. So here's the emotions that are coming up and here I am present and looking at them. I am not unconscious and lost in them. I haven't got sucked into the thought stream, you know, I haven't let go of the Holy Spirit's hand. So, okay, there's fear going on. Great, that's the fear of God's attack. But God wasn't attacked because the separation isn't real. Let me join with the Holy Spirit. Let me feel that peaceful place in my mind, even as I'm looking at the fear. Even as I'm looking at the pain. Even as I'm looking at my inadequacy. All this is from the separation from God. So all I'm asked to do is don't have them going on autopilot. Don't have your feelings and thoughts going on autopilot. That's all you're asked to do. Go to that place in your mind that can peacefully watch them and let them be there. And that will undo it. It might take five minutes. It might take five days. Whatever it takes, allow, allow your unconscious guilt to be there without trying to make someone else to blame for it and be present with it. That's how you bring the darkness to the light of awareness, to the light of the Holy Spirit. So again, we don't want to get caught in the idea that I now have to fight this darkness with the light. I, I, you know, I have to like undo this unhappiness. I have to get rid of it now or, you know, I'm failing the course. That, that, that's, see, we're, we're completely wrong. Love doesn't oppose. All you're asked to do is join with the Holy Spirit as a non-judgmental awareness and allow your unconscious guilt to pass through your awareness. So, can't remember who asked that question. Was it Sheila? Does that, does that answer the question? Was it Sheila asked the question? 
It, it did. I'm sorry. I was trying to hit my mute button. I couldn't get to it. <laughs> yes, Sally. It did. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, good, good. Anyone else have a question? Cindy has her hand raised. Cindy? Cool. You go for it, Cindy. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for your service to us having this Zoom call. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, I have two points, two questions that have been obstacles for me in my years of studying the course. And I fear they're going to come across as contrary, but I'm actually really in earnest about them. Um, the first one is just outing the ego thought that the return to one mind sounds boring. And from that, I have this very deep existential fear that from that place, we'll just start this all over again, that we weren't satisfied with the perfection the first time and created this split mind. How do I know we're not just going to do it all over again? There's a fear that it really isn't satisfying, that getting back to that one mind isn't satisfying. And it really plagues me. Mm. Um, so I'm going to answer this, but these are the kind of answers that get me into trouble with everywhere on the internet, right? Because people don't. Know I, I know it's contrary, and I apologize <laughs> for that. But no, it, no, no, no. It, it's a perfectly legitimate question. It's a perfectly legitimate question. Okay. Um, the first thing to bear in mind is we're we're now talking about it like the separation happened, right? But it didn't. Now that's one we have to keep coming back to in our minds because you know it is a total you know head melter um you know jesus is quite adamant in the course nothing happened not one note in heaven's symphony was missed um and so so now we have to be careful that we don't kind of like convince ourselves that it's happened because it hasn't um and, and 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 the way that we how to know that it hasn't is because when you do connect with the Holy Spirit in your mind, when you do let go of your concepts, you know, you let go of all your crazy voice in your head. I keep saying that, so I should qualify it. You know, Jesus tells us, you know, to, to enter the holy instant. Um, you don't have to have no pure thoughts. Um, you just have to not want to hold on to any of them. You have to not value any of them. So don't worry if you still got a crazy voice in your head. You just have to not value it. And if, if once you're not valuing it, you know it's nonsense. You, you're connected with the Holy Spirit. You're connected at that place of peace in your mind. So how, how do we know the separation hasn't happened? Because the Holy Spirit part of my mind um, knows it hasn't. All that peace and love and oneness is there. And, 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 and it's there no matter what's going on with my physical body or within the illusory world. Um, so, you know, I, I think, <laughs> see, again, um, so I, I kind of think about this in two steps. Like our only job is to get to the real world. And then from the real world, consciousness itself is undone. So, so it's not my job that I have to like delete myself or I have to like, you know, you know, cease to exist or it's like that that's not the case. Um, um, but what, what I do have to get to a point is I have to know my identity as that, um, that memory of oneness in my mind. I have to be totally identified with that love and peace and oneness um, within my mind and know that the world can't touch it. Doesn't matter what happens, the world can't touch this space inside of me. And I have to no longer be identified with this insane voice talking to itself in my mind. Yeah, getting to that place is something that seems to elude me. I understand it as a concept. I accept it as the truth, as the message of the course. But, you know, over the weeks, as you've been talking about looking in the cinema, you know, with Jesus at, at you know, rising above the battlefield and, and seeing the illusion and not judging it, I, it makes me feel this panic because my only experience seems to be the awareness that I'm in this illusion and I can't get out. I, I can't seem to tap into, or certainly not for any length of time, that that place of right mind or Holy Spirit assurance. Okay. That, 
You're saying is I can't get that sense of the Holy Spirit. Okay, good. That's not unusual. Um, and certainly, you know, um, in terms of my own path, it was something I felt when I was younger. Uh, it made me want to be a priest and various different things when I was a kid. Um, um, no, not all the time. I had no conscious control over it. It's just that it would happen spontaneously by times. And, and it did happen in the early days when I read the course and stuff like that, that I would just feel that sense of inspiration and peace and my God, this is true. Did you ever read the course and go, my God, that feels true? Oh, yeah, I've definitely had the moments like. Okay, no, but see, this is, see, no, that's that stop. <laughs> that's it. That's your Holy Spirit mind. So so never to say to yourself and, and um, I've, I've never felt that connection with the Holy Spirit because you have. Um, um, and that's really important. I can't never. sustain it. That's, yeah, that's the problem. Neither could I. And, and actually, I still can't. Right. So, you know, join the club. Um, we're all working on being able to sustain it. When you can sustain it, Cindy, you're in the real world. Oh. Heaven, you're, you're outside the gates of heaven and you, you know, you'd be let in any minute. Um, so we're all working towards that. We're all working towards being able to sustain it. Now, my own personal journey, like I say, I had those moments in the past and I, you've had them as well. So that doesn't make me special anyway. But I had those moments where I just felt, you know, that, 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 that oneness of God, that all is well, despite whatever's happening in the world, you know? And like I say, The Course of Miracles is full of beautiful passages that, that, that would have done that. And, and then, um, you know, I had a sort of a, you know, if you do this course and you really get the, if you really get this course, you're going to have to go through your darkness at some point in time. You're going to have to go through the darkness of your ego identity. Um, and, and I had mine and, you know, and it was, it was just anxiety and fear that came up and just didn't go for eight years. Um, and, and I just, whereas I had previously meditated and, you know, about the course and, and periodically felt that connection with like God and oneness for eight years, that was gone. And that was the most God awful aspect of the whole thing. It wasn't the anxiety, it wasn't the fear, it wasn't the self-hatred and the, the lack of confidence and the, ugh, it wasn't any of that. It was that the light was no longer in my mind. I couldn't reach that place ever. It was God awful. Um, and, and like I say, it took eight years before I finally said, but no, there must, there must be another way. And I was like, okay, I know the course is the way I have read it. And I've had those moments and I know this is true. And I know now, now it feels, it feels like I've had to write that off in my life because of my anxiety, but I just can't live my life without it because it's meaningless. I've had this glimpse of the truth and nothing else is ever going to fill me up or make, give my life purpose, no matter how good it is or, or anything else. Um, and so I just decided I would throw myself into it. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to rehash the story because I've told it loads of places on the internet, but, but I, I listened to Ken for like at least three hours, three and a half hours a day. I, I, I nailed this forgiveness process, uh, which is just simply you're, you're looking without judgment. You're, that's what you are. You are the non-judgmental awareness of the crap that's going on in your head. And, and, I, and so, and I just looked at that anxiety, um, Every time I could remember to go back into my, I would notice that, you know, I'm anxious and my heart had palpitations and I had the shakes or whatever. And I would just go back into the cinema with Jesus in my mind. Um, and I would just look at it and I would just regularly say to myself, what does it have to do with the love and peace of the Holy Spirit in my mind? Now, when I did that in the beginning, it was from memory. I was remembering what it felt like to, okay. to have inspiration that place of peace in my mind and and it was an utter leap of faith that says I've, I've felt it before I know it's still there and I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna you know put all my eggs in this basket I'm just gonna absolutely declare this what I believe and and so and I did that with my anxiety and I did it for months and you know the anxiety was still there I was just the allowing of it with Jesus saying what does it have to do with you know the me that's here with Jesus? What does it have to do with the me that's aware of it? And a few months down the line, it was gone. The anxiety was gone. It just, that this peace came into the back of my mind. Um, but, but, you know, in terms of that, you know, peace, and I would call that, you know, I would call that an awakening. Um, it does not mean he is enlightened or anywhere near us. I would call it an awakening. Um, and so, and, but but now I have to work. I have to work daily 
on noticing when I'm in my wrong mind and coming back into my right mind. You know, and and I have to I have to work daily on looking at what's disturbing me and how I'm, you know, blaming the world for my lack of peace and realizing, you know, that's not because of the world, that's because I'm in my wrong mind. If I was in my right mind, nothing would be disturbing me, not if they were crucifying me. So I, you go back into that right mind and you confirm, yep, love and peace is still here. And not the insane personal mind, you know, and, and what happened in the world. I can come back here. This is what I really am not the body, not the insane voice. What I am is this that's connected with the peace in my mind. And, and that's the practice. And like I say to you, you know, um, a lot of the time, until you bring yourself to a certain point, um, you're gonna be working from memory. Work from memory. You, everyone here on this call knows what it's like to feel that sense of inspiration, to have all the concepts in your mind just fall away for a moment and um, to have that, you know, that voice in your head just in a moment of wonderment and awe with love or beauty or whatever it is, just for it to come, come to an end temporarily. And this peace arises inside of us and this sense of all this wellness. You know, even psychologists would call that like a peak experience. Um, so, so there's even scientific names for it because everyone experiences this. And that is the Holy Spirit. That is the part of your mind that's not the insane voice of the body. And, and, in your forgiveness, um, you just, in the beginning, you, 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 you just put all your attention on that. And, and, and in the beginning, sometimes it's gonna feel gray and nebulous and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have that, you know, all encompassing love and peace and everything else. It, it feels a bit gray, but the more you put your attention on it, the more you return to it, each time you notice yourself in your crazy mind and you come back into it, the, it, the, the grayness and the, and, and, the, and the neutrality starts to like, um, evolve and, and it just becomes golden and it just becomes peaceful and it just becomes a, a confirmation in your mind that this is what I am I'm not the crazy voice of the body I actually am this and, and it just grows um, so 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 my advice is don't want the sparks and fireworks every single time because I sure as hell didn't have them for months when I started doing it um, just just put all your faith and trust in it and and, and as Jesus says in the course what you are will tell you of, of itself. And, and, and remember, the way you access that Holy Spirit mind is that you look at your ego without judging it. If you're going, this is bad, this is a bad ego, it shouldn't be like this, I should be better. You see, straight away, that's hopeless. What you have to do is, whatever the hell is going on, you have to look at it without judging yourself. And that's the magic. Yeah, because I, I think, you know, I've been told that the, the ego is sort of setting me up with a question that I can't get an answer to, to try and keep the illusion real. And, and that's what it feels like. Like, I feel like I, I have all my eggs in the basket, except for this one question that, that holds me back. So I guess I need to focus on looking at that one distorted sort of perception. And, and that, that and action is, even if I get home to God, I might not be happy. Right. See, it presupposes that you've left heaven. Right. I mean, this, this is a tricky <laughs> argument, right? Because all I'm aware of is this experience, even though I'm in the illusion. So yeah, but, yes, but, but, but again, to be clear, you've had those moments of connection. Right, 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 right. right where yeah. you're, not, you're not those experiences. Right. And that means the separation didn't happen because if you had separated, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be there. Right. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, so, and I, I okay, so I, at the risk of repeating myself, but, but it, I guess I've already mentioned. See, again, you, we have these thoughts in our mind and we have this idea that I was the thinker, this personal mind. But as Jesus says, the ego at no point in time actually exists at all. Like, you don't know what your next, what your next thought is going to be. So what happens is thought happens because the ego programmed it to happen. And afterwards, you insert the idea that you had the thought. And then you just act like I had that thought but you didn't, it happened. And then you inserted the thought that you had it. But you see, so, so, so you're saying, well, I have this experience of being this thinker, but the truth is you've never been the thinker. Right. You've just inserted a thought that you were, but it's not actually true. So, so the, the, the thoughts in your mind like that, the, the thinker that's having them doesn't exist. 
Um, does that make sense? Um, it's a lot to digest, but I, I, I'm willing. I, I am praying for willingness, and I appreciate your patience and not walking a, through this. Um, I really, really struggle with this point, and it's hard to find someone to talk to about it. So, yeah. okay. But again, bear in mind, Jesus says to us, salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts. Now, again, listen to what he's saying. There is nothing more to awakening in heaven than dropping all of your concepts. He gave us a massive book of concepts, illusory concepts, all carefully crafted to bring us to a point of readiness to let all concepts go. And once they're gone, we've ne- we're back where we never left. Yeah, I, I, the Spirit gave me a message a couple of weeks ago that seems relevant now as it has been every day that the answer to all my concerns is I don't know. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, because whatever you think you know is wrong, <laughs> only the absence, you see, and again, the Holy Spirit and salvation is not the answering of all your questions. It's the end of them. Sorry, say that again. The Holy Spirit and indeed your salvation is not the answering of all your questions. It okay. is the end of all your questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate it. Yeah. Does that make sense? I'm working on it. Yeah, because your, your personal mind, your personal mind will try and convince you, no, 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 it's about the answers. Right, right. Okay? That's what your personal mind would do. Um, but the trick is to actually go, it's, 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 in, the, it's, it's, in, it's in non-question. It's, it's when I go, I don't know what anything's for. So that was great guidance you got. Um, show me a different way of looking at this. And the different way of looking at it is, you know, it's, it's not about answers. It's the experience of looking. <laughs> the looking is the answer. Yeah, so, that, that's been a strong message from you for the last month or so. It's just, yeah, yeah the willing to, willingness to look and yeah. not judge the experience of it. Yes. And see the, that it means nothing. Like, it means nothing. Absolutely. Because, because the looking is the answer because you are that which looks non-judgmentally. All the judgments are a lie. It's, it's an ego script. Yeah. So what you are is that which looks without judgment. So the, the whole trick is just watch the ego without judgment. That's the trick. But that's so hard. We've got to keep nailing that one. We keep wanting to judge the ego. We want to fight the ego. We want to fix the ego. I want to be a better ego. I want to be a holy ego. And, and that's where we go wrong. <laughs> All we're asked to do, join with the Holy Spirit and spend time with your insane self. Mm-hmm. That's what the Course of Miracles is. Join with the Holy Spirit and spend all that time with your insane self. Woohoo! <laughs> Have we any more questions, Eli? Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to read this from the chat. Uh, Junda, I'm not sure how to say her last name. That's I'm sorry, fine. I don't know. Anyway, she asked, what do you do when you know your ego is so threatened and it constantly in fear? Uh, the Holy Spirit seems so far away. Yeah, so I hopefully we'll have that question now. Um, you know, th- we're going to go through times in our, in our spiritual path where the Holy Spirit does not seem present. Um, and so, and so what, what you do is you work from memory. You know, John, that there have been those moments where you have, you know, read something from the course or watched something about the triumph of the human spirit and were moved to tears or, or you held your first child. There, there are moments where joy was present in your life, which was the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, our, our, you see, the, the, the Holy Spirit is our right mind. It's, it's the memory, at least, of our, our true self and our relationship with God. And, and that is just happiness, right? That's what's there is happiness um, and joy and peace and then the problem is we have um put an insane voice in our head and so you know this happiness and peace is is the backdrop this is this is the sky all right so what you are is the sky and then we've put an insane voice in our head which is the clouds it's the thoughts and the questions and the judgments and the the needs and the wants and 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 and, and what we've done is we've filled up the sky with clouds and then you see every time we do have a moment of genuine inspiration or joy or happiness in life, it's never from the clouds. It's because the clouds part 
and we get a glimpse of our true nature and our right mind. So that's what the Holy Spirit is, right? So all the unhappiness and the noise and the judgments and the concepts and the questions and all of that, that's the clouds. That's what obscures our true nature. And, and, and thought never produces any kind of happiness at all. Anytime there's a genuine happiness in life, the clouds shift. Something shifts them. And like I say, it could be a moment of awe or appreciation or love or um, just something that transcends the normal and the, the clouds just part and our, and our true self is there. And, and that's what we are joined with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's pure awareness. That's our true self. Okay, um, so. And, so, and so I would just say work, work with memory because you, you know what that is. Um, you know, it, the real magic is I don't know what anything's for. You know, watch the insane voice in your head. No, it's not going to work. It's not going to fix anything. It doesn't have the answer to your happiness. The answer to your happiness is being is bringing peace to it. So join with join with that place of peace in your mind and just what does it have to do with the Holy Spirit in my mind? If you have to work to, from memory in terms of what it feels like to have the Holy Spirit in your mind, work with that. I did that and it worked because the Holy Spirit is the sky. The sky is always there, even when the clouds are there. The sky is never not there. The Holy Spirit is never not there. Your right mind is never not there. It is just obscured by the clouds. So trust that. Work from memory if you have to and just go, what does the anxiety and fear in my mind have to do with love and peace of the Holy Spirit. So I hope that helps. Okay, and, and my question. Go ahead. I'm not, sure if, I'm not sure if I'll be able to word this properly, but uh, let's say in the last five weeks, I've only had two situations where I really kind of really felt like I needed to look at it with Holy Spirit sort of thing. But my normal everyday life is quite happy nothing goes wrong everything is smooth and easy and beautiful and so and even though I'm still working on watching everything with Holy Spirit I just don't come across say what I would consider forgiveness opportunities because you know well gold darn it there's a cheesecake sitting on my counter I can't forgive that and so like how do you um, oh, and now I look at this. You can't see it, but I'm having coffee delivered to me. I mean, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> and so with all that, it's all of that much as, yeah, it's happy and beautiful and wonder. It's still illusion. Yeah. And but, so uh, when, how when, do when, I backstep from it is what I'm trying to ask, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you watch, when you watch the news, Eli, or like you read something, do you not notice I your don't. mind automatically? You don't do that. No. Okay. I never have. Even before the course, I never. Someone usually okay. tells you, but whatever. <laughs> okay, so when you watch a movie, your mind is going to sort it out into the good guys and the bad guys. And it's going to see different. And it's going to see the evil and the good. Now, now, that actually is the same process that goes on in us in our daily life as well. Okay, so it's a movie in a movie. <laughs> yeah yeah okay. absolutely um and, and 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 it's it's art reflecting life or non-life in the sense that that's what we're doing in our day we're dividing everything out we're not seeing everything as one you know what we're, we're, we're what, what we do is we we look at someone on the street and we make judgments about them about what how tall they are how small they are how heavy they are how light they are how old they are how young they are and we make assumptions about who they are we we just create a, a self for them and we project it out and we put it on them and and we sit in judgment on that like self that we've just made for them um and so the practice of the course is getting to the point where everything is one where everyone you see is christ and we're not going to do that <laughs> as soon as we can do that we'll know our, we'll know we're christ um so yeah. what we what we want to do is now that doesn't mean that we don't see differences and it doesn't mean that our insane mind doesn't label it first it will but it's that we've noticed it and asked for a different way of seeing it would that make sense it does and it helps yes yes thank you so it's so it's next really... up we have brian so i'm gonna let him go ahead thanks cool. Keith. Go ahead, right? Okay. 
Ooh, your sound is cutting in and out, Brian. It's cutting in. Apparently. I think your internet's slow because you're freezing, Brian. Why don't you stick a, a tr try and condense this just into a little question in the chat box and Eli will keep an eye out for it. I'm volunteering you, Eli. <laughs> Do we have any other questions and we can come back to Brian in the chat box? Yes, uh, Fran has her hand up and that would be the last of them. Go ahead, Good. Fran. Hi, thank you, Keith. I missed your last one and um, some some things that have come up um, during this uh, talk. One, um, I realized that I have been, my ego has been an adrenaline junkie from the get-go. And so uh, as I have uh, processed trying to, what's heaven, what's hell, et cetera, uh, wanting more and more, I've used even my pursuit of spirituality or something, you know, uh, more than me, the Holy Spirit. I've even used that in a, in a adrenaline seeking kind of way. So my highs and lows, I was mistaking heaven and hell a lot. And then I just got so tired of the drama, you know, that fail safe thing God did. We, we can't keep going with this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, God. Okay. So, so that piece has been really useful. One of the things that I'm grateful for that you use a lot, and it's in the um, uh, course, it's, it's sort of this instant, you know, chain jerk as God is walking his dog, <laughs> he jerks the chain. And the thing that gets me back is I don't know what anything is for. And that is so powerful. And I have had, I've been doing a lot of joining uh, exercises and taking um, my, you know, uh, warehouse of shit <laughs> to, to <laughs> be looked at with Jesus. Um, and every once in a while, he assures me there's a pony. Uh, I was walking through the kitchen, my kitchen the other day, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, who? I feel happy. And it was very calm. It had nothing to do with a high or a low or anything outside of me. And I just was kind of flabbergasted and giggled. And of course, it, you know, that too passes. But nonetheless, I am, the progress is I'm constantly taking, I am becoming aware, son of a gun, of that I am the observer. And I'm, I'm so grateful. Yeah, I am just so grateful. Quick example, and then I'll get off. I was reading in the paper, and I, I, my husband's a news junkie, and I don't even get in the conversation with him about politics or anything. Uh, but, I'm, but I still harbor some right and wrong stuff. So I'm looking in the paper, and there's this one Supreme Court justice. Uh, you all know what's going on in the United States. Uh, and I'm going, blah, 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 blah. and then we're we're uh, elected a new one, and oh, I think she's lovely, and and it was interesting because well, actually, before I saw that, I'm bad mouthing this one or going down that judgment. I'm going, what does this have to do with me? Yeah. And then I'm looking at the one I approve of, and all of a sudden, I got the same phrase. What does that have to do with me? That was a glorious moment. I, I don't know how else to say it. It was just the good illusion and the bad illusion. It's still, I'm still separate, but something's, I'm just grateful. I'm yeah. just grateful. So From, that's, yeah. And I'm, I'm so happy to hear you say that today. <clears throat> now, let me try and hold myself together for a second. Um, because I because I felt for the last um, few, few right I felt for the last few weeks that you were on the verge of like massive breakthrough and and I'm kind of breaking one of my own rules here um, you know because Ken Wapnick said you know if someone ever tells you they're talking to the Holy Spirit run a mile and if they ever tell you the message of the Holy Spirit you should run much further much faster 
um, and, and he said that for very good reasons. But um, for a while now, whenever I chat with the Holy Spirit, uh, you come into my mind as, um, and, it, and it's that I have to give you this message, which is the love that makes you cry is what you are in Jesus. Thank you. Okay, so, and I knew I couldn't hold myself. Thank you, not Keith. <laughs> Um, it's it, that, that's it's you know again the love that makes you cry is is what you are in the Holy Spirit, Fran. That's 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 your right mind, and and I and I knew you were just on the verge of getting that, and, and it's lovely that you confirmed that before I said that to you because now it's just a confirmation that that's true. So, for what it's worth. <laughs> um, yeah, we are. Uh, here's the phrase I had from the lesson today, and I want to give it to everybody. One with all my brothers, I am. So that's the name of God. Uh, uh, uh. It's with all of us. Thank you. No problem. So Brian, you shout and you can close us out today. I think that should work. Give it a go. We know. Yeah, I think well, so. Go have a question. So, yeah, I, so I, Eli touched on this a little bit, I think. It's, I only seem to want to uh, get in touch with the Holy Spirit when I'm experiencing turbulence in my life. But when things are like neutral or things are good, I just don't seem to try to reach the Holy Spirit. And I guess the question is, how do I tune into the Holy Spirit when I don't even... I mean, things are going okay. Yeah, I think this is a really good um, question. I think it's important for everyone. So thanks, Brian. The, at the end of the day, um, you do not want to like be holding yourself to the impossible um, task of being joined with the Holy Spirit all the time, because um, that is only going to produce guilt. Um, any spiritual practice that you do that produces guilt is counterproductive. It's, it's crap. And so, you know, um, and, and, and this is why, Jesus tells us in the course, this is why he talks about the importance of um, extending the Holy Spirit. So he doesn't say, you know, just connect with the Holy Spirit and that's fabulous. What he says is, if you want to, you can only keep what you give away. So, so the only way for us to keep the Holy Spirit in our, in our mind is to see it in everyone else, regardless of what the insane voice in their head is saying or doing, or what their illusory body is doing, or what's going on in the world. Um, the way that we hold the Holy Spirit in our mind is by seeing the Holy Spirit in everybody else. That's, 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 that's the trick Jesus gives us. He's as much as saying to us, you can't, you can't hold it um, in your present state unless you're extending it. So you've got to see it in everyone else. And, and that's the trick. And so what you want to do is what I was saying to Eli, which is that you want to watch the way your mind is differentiating and you know making differences between people and all the little micro judgments that are going on all the time the trick is just that you notice your judgments going on which means you're in your own mind and you slip back into your holy spirit mind and then you see that same holy spirit mind in the person that you thought was different from you and so really the trick is noticing your judgments it, it's not you see well, you, you want to notice when there's an emotional charge. If you're joined with the Holy Spirit, there's no charge. So what you want to do is watch for charge, which is something that makes me fearful or apprehensive or scared or angry or irritated, or you want to watch for a charge. And, and that's just, and, and so the beauty of that is that reminds us to go back to the Holy Spirit. And, and again, we, we, we hold that by, by seeing it in everything else outside of us. That's how you hold it within yourself. But again, what you don't want to do is hold yourself to an impossible standard of holding it all the time. We've got too much unconscious guilt for that. That's what the course is for. That's what the whole process is for, where we slip back into the Holy Spirit. So, so that's my big advice to everyone. Don't hold yourself to an impossible ideal of being having the Holy Spirit in your mind all the time. You want to just watch for the charge when it comes up, because that's your unconscious guilt back you go into the holy spirit and let's undo that guilt does that make sense just watch for the charge watch the charge remember you're connected with the holy spirit everything's the same um and so you want to watch for emotional charges because that means you're not with the holy spirit you're, you're making judgments and you're making things different and you're defending an illusion your personal self 
Um, so that's what you want to do. You, it, it's, it's not about staying connected with the Holy Spirit all the time. It's noticing when you're not and going back to it. That's the magic. But just don't, d- don't let yourself um, get into any spiritual practices that actually instill guilt because that's, that's not a spiritual practice. That's, that's the ego trapping you. So I hope that makes sense. Question about the theory, if we have time. Sorry, go ahead, Brian. The theory, if we have time. Um, so there seems to be three ideas of self, um, the ego self, which is the human, the decision maker and Christ. So Brian cannot be saved because Brian is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Christ doesn't need saving and the decision maker is not Christ. So I don't understand like who is being saved why why the course is written addressing the decision maker if the decision maker is not christ it's like who is being saved because brian's not being saved christ it's, doesn't need saving so that's that's a controversial question um uh because the, the the decision maker is a term that kenneth wapnick um uh, originated I and mean, he's gotten loads of stick for it um but 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 the, and, and i mean you see the way the course is written, it makes total sense because Jesus is ta- saying like the ego will tell you this and the ego will do that and the Holy Spirit will tell you this and the Holy Spirit will tell you that. So the, the course kind of inserts the idea of like this decision maker that's deciding between two, two thought systems. Um, but the thing is that there is only the right mind and the wrong mind. So you have the virtual reality program that's running and you have the scripted thoughts and feelings that are coming up as a result of your unconscious guilt. And that's the wrong mind. And it doesn't actually exist. And then there's the right mind where there is the memory of the thoughts that we think with God, where there's that causeless joy, that peace um, and that oneness and that um, abstract love. And, and, and so there's just the wrong mind and the right mind. Um, now, so Ken did something very clever because what he said was, okay, the course writes it like there's a decision maker. And so what he said was, there's a decision maker and <clears throat> it's either joined with the ego or it's joined with the Holy Spirit. Um, so there's no, there's no such thing as a decision maker. Um, the decision maker, there's no such thing as a decision maker that's not joined with the Holy Spirit or not joined with the ego. It's one or the other. Um, and so, and so that, that's very clever because the ego, the decision maker itself is an illusion. But so the, the key thing is, there's no such thing as a decision maker by itself. He cannot be neither and he cannot be both. So you can't be in your wrong mind and your right mind. And you can't be in neither your wrong mind or your right mind. So it's either one or the other. So your, your question makes sense and your confusion makes sense, Brian, because there is just the wrong mind and the right mind. Um, and, and the thing is, you know, which one are you in? Um, so, so like I say, that that's controversial, the whole decision maker thing. Lots of people hate Ken's teaching about a decision maker. Ken never said there was a decision maker. He said, you're either the decision maker joined with the ego or with the Holy Spirit. You're either in your wrong mind or your right mind. You either think it has something to do with you or you know it hasn't anything to do with you. And so in terms of... Um, why is the course written? Well, it, it's, the, it's the end of suffering. It's so we, we don't stay in our wrong mind and suffering persists. Suffer, who, who does the suffering stop for? Um, I, it's the end of the wrong mind. It's the end of the wrong mind. It's, it's, you know, so the mind is split. Um, and there's the insane part of the mind that thinks this is real. And there's the sane part of the mind that knows it's not. And the, the, the course is just about ending the illusion. So it's about finding peace. It's about realizing you are the peace and always have been. The rest was just a nightmare. So it's about undoing illusions.
And again, you know, ultimately, Jesus says, that's the end of concepts. That's all that's necessary. All, it's just once the concepts are gone, that's it. We, we, wake, we wake in oneness. So really, the purpose, the purpose of the course is, to, I mean, you see, all of this is the atonement. Everything that appears to be happening in the world um, right now, that's all the atonement. The ego, you know, had this thought of sacredness and, um, and the Holy Spirit has undone all of it. And so really, in terms of the world that's out there, really, this is just the atonement happening in slow motion. Um, but we don't have to like wait for the peace. We can just step back into, into the awareness we are with the Holy Spirit. We don't have to wait until like, you know, everything is undone within the illusion. So you know, really, Jesus says over and over and over again in the course, you know, just, you know, be still a minute and go home. Like what he's saying is you are your right mind. The wrong mind's an illusion. So, you know, even the idea of a journey is ridiculous because we're already the right mind. You know, God can't be attacked. We can't lose his love. And um, that's, that, that's what's actually true. And so it's, it's really just about on, on us undoing the guilt um, so we can return to being as God created us. So I hope that makes sense, right? We've, as usual, we've gone way over on our timing, but I hope you've all uh, enjoyed our meeting today. Thanks a million for everyone um, for participating. And um, it's so much, good. Keith. It was so wonderful. Good to see uh -huh. everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Thank everyone. You, everybody. Good to Thank see you, Eli. Thank you, good to see you, Keith. Keith. Thank you so much. Bye, Thank, Thank you very much. much. Namaste. Have a good Sunday. Yeah. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you so Thank much. You. much. Happy Fourth of July, everybody in America. <laughs> Happy Fourth of July. Bye. Bye.